Hi, everyone. Um, today, welcome to today's department seminar. Um, so today, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Rose Yu here, uh, who is an assistant professor at UC San Diego, kind of our neighboring university, uh, where she is a professor of computer science and engineering. So Rose earned her PhD in computer science at the University of Southern California. So she's been around here for a while, but then she actually had a couple of years in the cold north, where she currently is. Uh, at the uh, Northeastern University prior to returning back to beautiful California. And um, so her research focuses on machine learning techniques for large scale spatial temporal data analysis, in particular with applications to sustainability, health, and the physical sciences. And so her research really emphasizes physics guided uh, AI, which aims to integrate uh, first principles with data driven models. And she has like had many awards, including the Google Faculty Research Award, Adobe Award. Um, and, and several NSF awards. And yeah, so today I really look forward to a talk titled Physics Guided AI for Learning Spatial, Spatial Temporal Dynamics. And hand it Thank over you, to Stefan. Thank you, it's a great honor to give talk at UCI. You know, when I was a PhD student at USC, I started using UCI machine learning data sets. Then I, you know, I would go to UCI to attend the Machine Learning Southern California Machine Learning Symposium and met with the great faculty and students there. Now it's super honored to be here and talking about my research, given the fact I'm also moving to Southern California in a couple months. So hopefully I'll see you guys in person at some point. Um, so today I will talk about some of the uh, research that our group and uh, our collaborators have been working on really you know, to push the effort of learning spatial temporal dynamics with the hope that we can bridging the gaps between first principle modeling and, and data-driven decision-making. So let me first start with a few motivations of why we want to learn spatial temporal dynamics. Uh, if we think about you know, all the applications around us from public health, uh, in the case of forecasting COVID-19 dynamics to transportation, where we want to solve traffic congestion problem to you know, climate science, which perhaps is the most uh, challenging problem in our century. All the data that we collected from these domains have very rich spatial and temporal information. So this kind of pattern exists not only in this domain, but further along in many other domains in engineering and science. So if we can you know, leverage the large amount of data collected in these domains and uh, learn accurately the spatial temporal dynamics underneath this phenomenon, then we'll be really able to make progress in science and engineering to help us make real-time real decisions. Now, compared with traditional machine learning applications, spatial temporal dynamics or you know, analyzing spatial temporal data pose unique challenges to machine learning. Here I'm listing a few technical challenges uh, incurred by learning spatial temporal dynamics. So one of the challenges is long range dependency. So here is a picture of the El Nino phenomenon where you can see that the warm ocean current flows all the way to the east and that would affect the temperature in North America. And this kind of long range dependency not only happens in space, but also happens over time. So traditional machine learning applications often are limited to deal with short term dependencies and assume that data are inde independently identically distributed or IID. However, in learning spatial temporal data, this kind of long range dependency will make problems extremely challenging. The second challenge is higher order correlation. So when we think about spatial temporal data, we not only need to model the correlations across different timestamps, but also different locations. And on top of that, we also need to take care of the correlations among different features, which incurs higher order correlation. And then because of higher order correlation, the challenge that we face in machine learning is the so-called curse of dimensionality because the number of features explodes with the number of dimensions in space, time, and number of features. 
The third challenge is probably the most unique challenge of spatial temporal dynamics, which is nonlinear dynamics. So hurricane is a canonical example of nonlinear dynamics. So what I mean by nonlinear dynamics is the underlying phenomenon cannot be simply captured by a linear model. And nonlinear dynamics also is notoriously for being sensitive to initial condition, a phenomenon also known as the butterfly effect. Um, another challenge that is associated with spatial temporal learning is that the data often comes in a multi-scale structure because the space-time data are naturally continuous. However, when we want to represent them in computers, we have to discretize them in a certain fashion. So when we discretize space and time at different resolution, that will lead to multi-scale structure. So the framework that uh, our group has been trying to build is called physics guided AI. The reason we start looking at this, even though I had zero physics-based training, unlike Stefan, is because uh, space-time really has been studied for decades in the area of physics, right? Uh, the majority of the research in physics is about understanding space and time. So in physics, you know, people often start with first principle models, and then they use model-based approaches to describe the patterns underneath space-time data. So in physics, there are a lot of tools such as tensor network, which I did for my PhD thesis, differential equations and mean field theory. So the nice thing about physics-based methods is that they are extremely precise and they are very simple efficient, right? They encode our domain knowledge of the underlying phenomenon. However, the downside of physics-based models is they're sometimes computationally expensive and uh, they don't really capture well the, uh, the real world data. Sometimes they have mid model misspecification problems because we cannot afford to find closed form solutions underneath some of these equations. On the other hand, we have machine learning. So machine learning is based on statistical inference and we derive data-driven models. And in machine learning, we also have our own tools such as graphical models, neural networks, and variational bias. Right? So in machine learning, we are very proud because our models are flexible. We can learn from real, real world data, but unfortunately, machine learning models also have their own drawback because machine learning models require a lot of data to train. However, in many of the previous application domains I mentioned, it's quite expensive to collect the real world data. Another main disadvantage of machine learning is that sometimes they don't predict uh, physically meaningful uh, predictions. Because if we want to use these models for solving real world science and engineering problem, we want them to be physically meaningful. Right? So sometimes the machine learning models can generate predictions that we don't understand, or the predictions can just be completely wrong from a physical perspective. Uh, another challenge of machine learning model is generalization, because we know that machine learning models uh, predict well in a data domain that it has been trained on, but it performs often poorly to data domain that is outside of the training set. So that's another drawback of machine learning model. And you can see there's complementary strengths and weaknesses between physics-based model and machine learning model in analyzing space-time data. And physics-guided AI really try to bring together the best of both worlds. So in this way, we can encode inductive biases, which is domain knowledge from experts. We can improve generalization such that our model can adapt to very different environment and dynamics. We can also reduce sample complexity so that our models can be deployed in real world without collecting thousands, even to millions of data points. And most importantly, we can guarantee that the predictions from our model are trustworthy so that we can increase our trust in AI. So normally when I give this talk, I would just dive into each of the research projects that we've 
conducted so far and talk about the technical details and results. And today I, I decided to give a slightly different talk, uh, really just to show you different aspects of you can, how you can inject the physical knowledge into machine learning models. So I grouped different research into different categories. And I would just talk about the high level picture and the key ideas behind these projects. Uh, I hope that uh, you, know, you can through, see, uh, see the forest through the trees and, and really help us brainstorm together along this research direction. Uh, so the first uh, um, type of techniques that we can bring in physics and machine learning models is actually based on model ensemble. So I call it residual learning. Essentially, the idea is that let's say we have input time series x1 to xt. And then spatial temporal learning is to learn a dynamics model f that can help us forecast into the future. So this function f will map, map the historical data x0 to xt into future observations xt plus 1 to xt plus h. So the idea behind residual learning essentially is decompose this dynamic function into two parts. So f equals g minus r. So g is a physics-based model. It can be a differential equation, or it can be a stochastic uh, dynamics model that generate predictions based on physics knowledge. And r is a residual between the ground truth data and the predictions. So because there are a lot of unknown variables that cannot be captured by physics-based model, however, machine learning models can fix this gap. So we use machine learning models to learn the difference between the observational data and the physics model predictions. And before I move on, let me double check the chat uh, to see whether there's any questions. Okay, great. Yeah, feel free to ask any questions in the meantime on the chat and I will stop in the middle to answer your questions. Thank you. So that's the first uh, type of technique we can use to bring in physics and machine learning together, right? And we applied this technique to COVID-19 forecasting and our model was featured on the official CDC website. You can see that this is a screenshot from the CDC COVID-19 forecasting. And you can see that our team, which is UCSD and U team, because of my transition of two schools, is one of the official teams that forecast the number of deaths over different weeks. And this, week, uh, this work is really a, a collaboration from many different experts by graduate students, uh, Alan, Liao, and uh, a faculty from HDSI, Ian, and our collaborators in our system especially uh, Matteo and Alessandro, who have been working on epidemic modeling for many years. So as I mentioned before, the key idea behind you know, this type of work is to learn the residual between the physics model and the ground truth. So the physics model we use is called global epidemic and mobility model, or GLIM. So this is a model developed by uh, Alex Keen. And, uh, it essentially combines real world data on populations and human mobility. You can see that it leverages different type of mobility patterns from airport network, commuting network and population to uh, calculate a elaborate stochastic model for disease transmission. And the fundamental mathematical tools that it's based on is on compartmental SIR models. So, um, our idea is to basically to learn a residual between the GLIM model and the ground truth data. So this is the architecture that we ended up using, right? You can see that we have the difference between the GLIM and the data, and GLIM is a physics model, data is a ground truth from John Hopkins data set. So we pass this data in a form of time series, and then we use a encoder decoder type of architecture to make forecasts. Um, and one thing I want to make a, a note here is that on top of the time series data collected at different states, we also have the travel graph, which represents the commuting pattern. So in this model, we did use some version of graph neural network to further capture the commuting patterns. 
So let's see the difference here, right? So if we look at the deep learning model alone, which is a green bar, compared with the green model, which is a physics-based model, and deep learning model, which is this hybrid model that learns a residual, we can see that for three weeks ahead forecasting, uh, which is from May 31 to September, it was a couple of weeks ago, uh, a couple of one month ago, um, you can see that on um, the deep glean model, because it learns the residual of glean, it is actually more accurate than the glean model, whereas the deep learning model without the physics completely fails. Because in this case, we really have a very few data points. Um, and we can see that deep learning model doesn't do well with this limited amount of data. So here is a visualization of the prediction rolled out for different weeks. The ground truth is a solid black line, and then Glean model is in blue. Deep Glean, which is our model, is in the red line. You can see that you know, our hybrid model essentially follows the ground truth much closer than the other baselines. And in terms of the forecasting uncertainty, so here we also used uh, two types of uncertainty quantification method. One is based on quantile regression. The other one is based on stochastic gradient MCMC. Um, in both methods, actually, we found, you know, using deep glean as a way to forecast give us much confident forecast. You can see that the confidence interval is much narrower even than the, the original glean model. So that's our, you know, simple idea for forecasting COVID-19, but it was quite effective, which helped us make it to the CDC website. And the next example of this type of residual learning framework is the application of uh, aerospace engineering. So here, what we want to do is to solve the problem of ground effect. Um, if you ever played with drones before, you might have noticed that drones place very well flies very well in a normal wind condition. However, when you fly a drone closer to the ground or taking off, the drones become extremely unstable. The reason behind that is, you know, when the drone flies, it generates air around its body. So the air will interact with the ground with... Sorry, Sorry could everyone uh, mute their, their uh, micros if, if you don't speak? Thank you. Sorry, uh, I, I saw there's somebody asking questions. Okay, so yeah, so the ground effect problem is that because of the aerodynamics, the air interacts with the drone. So uh, the the more air ground effect it has, uh, you know, the more unstable the drone will fly. Sometimes it will lead to the drone to crash. Um, so this work is a joint work with collaborators at Caltech, and this was done during my postdoc there and it was, was published in ICRA 2019. So this idea of uh, residual learning also applies here, right? Suppose we have a simplified model for the drones, which, you know, here is the drone body and there are two rotors that generate thrust. So we can, you know, quantify different uh, variables in terms of position velocity and angular velocity. Uh, we can call the whole thing together as a state of the system. So the idea of learning the dynamic of the drone during uh, landing or taking off is essentially generating the next state given the underlying dynamics equations. Right? Those physics come in because we know the dynamics of the drone roughly. And these are derived from first uh, Newton's law, essentially. You can see that the first order dif uh, differential, uh, first order derivative of position is a velocity and so on and so forth. So the every terms in black are measurable from sensors. However, the terms in red are unknown variables. So these correspond to the unknown disturbance force uh, and unknown disturbance for a torque, right? So we don't know this disturbance torque and force because the chaotic air turbulence essentially is governed by Navier-Stokes equations. And we know that those questions are extremely hard to solve. So the idea that we first came up with to learn this residual in the red font, right? So we first do a residual learning by approximating the unknown disturbance force with the deep neural network. However, when we first tried this idea, we almost crashed the drone 
So the simple idea didn't work out very well for us. Um, and then we realized that, you know, to model the very intricate aerodynamics for drones, we also need to make sure that the dynamics are stable. So the key idea behind this work is we introduced spectral normalization as a way to constrain the Lipschitz constant of deep neural network. And we know from the definition of Lipschitz constant mm -hmm. is that it will bound the range of the output from this neural network functional approximator in a way that the dynamics generated by this neural network is always staying within certain intervals. And therefore it can help us learn very stable dynamics. Um, so let me show you a demo of the effect of using this hybrid learning approach, especially with the ground effect. So here is a video that shows the difference between a baseline approach, which is a PD controller, right? So you can see when a drone takes off and tries to land, it doesn't land exactly on the floor because of the ground effect. And you can see if we want to land the drone 3D from one corner of the cube to the other, we also have the same problem. However, when we look at this hybrid model, we call it neural lander because we blend the physics equations with neural nets. You can see that by learning the aerodynamics, the drone can stably and smoothly land on the ground. And we can see similar phenomena for the 3D landing as well. Um, and we also looked at a more challenging case, which is flying around the table. The top one is our approach. The bottom one is a baseline. Because of the fact that we can learn aerodynamics, the drone is able to fly around the table much closer to the surface without crashing. So this is especially useful if we want to deploy the drone in disaster rescue case and uh, take videos in a narrow channel. So here's the effect of uh, using a spectral normalization versus without. The left one is we use spectral normalization to regularize the Lipschitz constant of deep neural network. You can see that the linear trend between the vertical distance and vertical velocity extend from the training domain to the new domain. However, this trend disappears if we don't use spectral normalization. A more concrete example is in the table flying around the table case. You can see with that spectral, without, uh, with spectral normalization, the model has learned a very clear table boundary, which allows uh, the model to generalize into unseen domain. Whereas without spectral normalization, it doesn't learn this clear boundary. So actually, spectral normalized DN has been shown in a more theoretical uh, paper by Peter Ballett as it generalized well. So generalization is an indication of stability in machine learning. In this way, by regularizing the neural network and perform residual learning, we can improve the generalization ability of our model. So that's the first uh, type of techniques that we've discussed. Let me see whether there are some questions. So uh, Yong asked, are these results only by using machine learning models instead of the hybrid models and SIR? Oh, okay, never mind. Ting asked, uh, how is spectral normalization performed? That's right. So uh, yeah, I intentionally didn't talk about the details because as I mentioned before, I wanted to just give a high level overview of this work. But in, in practice, it's quite simple. So during training of the neural net, you can normalize the weights of the, each layer of your matrix by the largest singular value of the matrix. So in that case, you can regularize the spectral norm of the layer, each layer. And it is a technique that has been used in other work as well, such as spectral normalized scans. Okay, so the second type of uh, work that we can combine physics and learning is what I call as trainable operators. So let's say we are given you know, input time series again, x1 to xt. Uh, we want to learn a mathematical operator, but the key idea here is to parameterize the operator by a neural network. And there, therefore we can train it with a simple gradient descent type of method. 
right? So given the function f, we want to learn this mapping from x to y at time p. And this function, let's say, it is applied by an operator on L. So this is a Laplacian operator, right? It transforms the function f into a different domain. And in the kind of traditional um, definition of Laplacian operator, we basically multiply exponential negative xt by this function f of t, right? So f of t sometimes is also called filter in signal processing literature. And the idea here is to basically replace this function f of t with a trainable neural network with trainable weights. Right? And this is also the same idea behind convolutional operator, which leads to convolutional neural network. So we apply this idea to a couple of different applications. And one of them is called traffic forecasting. Um, so here is a picture of traffic forecasting, where the goal here is to forecast into the future the average speed of different row segments. Um, and you can see that you know, there is a very complicated spatial dependency here, because all the row segments that I'm listing here, one, two, three, are very close to each other, but then their time series are very different from each other, right? Because they're on different uh, side of the road. And the yellow line is because it's on the opposite side, it has very different patterns from the other two row segments. And this is joint work with uh, Yaguang at Google and Cyrus and Yen at USC. It was published in iClear 2018. Um, by the way, this also was deployed as part of the uh, Google map forecasting um, software platform. So the idea behind this work is that we wanted to parameterize the diffusion operator with trainable weights, right? So a diffusion operator in a, in a continuous case is a Laplacian operator. But then when we look at discretized regime, which is a graph, right, diffusion operator, you know, diffuses some density into different step of neighbors, right? Imagine, for instance, the center here represent the traffic jams, right, number of cars. Number of cars diffuses to different neighborhoods, right, to first order neighbors and second order neighbors and, and so on and so forth. And there are some parameters that governs the speed of this diffusion. So, so in graph theory, actually, there is a result that says uh, the stationary distribution of this diffusion process can be represented in this formula. So this formula basically said, you know, if I have the adjacency matrix of the graph, right, and I can calculate the uh, degree, the degree which is a diagonal element, the row sum of the uh, adjacency matrix, and I can call the whole thing a uh, random walk matrix. So if I raise this random walk matrix to different powers, it represents, you know, basically diffusion according to different steps. So the serial state that the stationary distribution of the diffusion process is basically an infinite combination of random walk operators. And there's some parameters here that was based on the graph coefficient before. Right? So the idea, our idea here is basically to parameterize this operator, right, by replacing theta with trainable weights in a neural network. Um, and because of the traffic forecasting application, we not only need to take care of the out degree diffusion, right, which represents the out, outward uh, forecast, uh, traffic flow, we also need to take care of the in degree diffusion symbolized by the in degree matrix here, di. So this in degree diffusion operator represents the, in the, the inward traffic flow, right? So we can parameterize this mathematical operator with uh, trainable weights, say that IK and say that OK, and then the in, input XT represents the speed of the average speed of different road segments at time T. So uh, actually when the time was, uh, during the time when the paper was published, it was a state of art method for forecasting uh, road network traffic. And since then, there have been many follow-up work that I cannot keep count. However, let me show you the result that we had before, right? So uh, before our paper, people were only to forecast accurately the road network traffic uh, for five minutes. And we were able to forecast quite accurately for one hour ahead. So this is the forecasting results in uh, LA, uh, where I did my PhD and postdoc. Um, and you can see that Compared with many different models, 
and our model, which is the orange bar here, DCRNN, achieves about 3.3 .3 miles per hour for one hour ahead forecasting, right? So uh, when I was a, a student in LA, the average speed of people driving is about 75 miles per hour. I don't know how things have changed now, um, but you know, out of 75 miles per hour or so, right? 3.3 .3 mile per hour is pretty small number um, in terms of forecasting error. And here, this one is the Bay Area forecasting result. Again, the orange bar, which is our model, achieves 2.2 .2 mile per hour accuracy uh, for one hour ahead forecasting. Right here, we can also look at the, the visualizations. As I mentioned before, you know, we are parameterizing the mathematical operator of diffusion operator. So we can you know, visualize the, the diffusion on the map. You can see that there are three diffusion centers identified by our model. Uh, probably you are very familiar with this map. Uh, you see that here represent the highway to Hollywood. And uh, this is really the highway in downtown LA. Right. And then the third one uh, actually is closer to Irvine. Um, and uh, it's, it's a highway that you need to take to go to Disneyland, right? So you see that you know, the model has automatically identified the diffusion hubs in the traffic. If we look at the prediction, uh, raw predictions, you see that compared with um, you know, commonly used time series models such as LSTM, right? Our model achieves much more accurate forecasting because it can capture this kind of dip much early on than the green line, which is LSTM. And that's one of the uh, possible reasons that this model performs quite well for traffic forecasting, right? And that's the diffusion operator. Uh, we also extended this work to a very different mathematical operator and the application has changed a lot. Uh, we have extended our application to from traffic forecasting to forecasting turbulence. And this work was done by my students and was published at KDD this year. Right? So the turbulence example is visualized here. And this particular type of turbulence is called Rennet-Bernard convection. Um, you can think about Rennet-Bernard convection as two type of fluids interacting with each other. The top one is a cold fluid. The bottom one is the, the hot fluids. Um, the reason we want to study this is because it represents a simple example as El Nino phenomena, where the warm fluid and the cool fluid interact on the Earth. So this is a work joint work with my students and collaborated as Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So what is the mathematical operator that we want to parameterize here? Well, we looked at the classic literature in computational fluid dynamics or CFD, right? To simulate this video alone, it will take a couple months. So the goal here is to develop a deep learning models that can significantly speed up the simulated simulation of this kind of turbulence. So in the CFD literature, there is a well-known technique called the Reynolds Renz LES coupling. Right? So this stands for Reynolds averaging or Renz, right? And LES coupling. So the idea here is that if we are given the you know, velocity field of a turbulence, W, right? W is a velocity field, and hence it is a function of the space X and time T. So REST LES coupling is the approximate method to simulate turbulence. Essentially, it computes a spatial filter to smooth out the velocity field over space using a convolutional kernel, G1. After that, it takes the residual of this velocity field and apply a spatial field, a temporal filter, G2, to further smooth out the turbulence field over time. And after you do all these operations, you get a much coarser grained velocity field, which then can be simulated much faster than the original velocity field. So again, you can see that these operators are nothing but convolutional operators. And people have been using manually designed operators before for this type of operation. So our idea here is to simply parameterize these operators in spatial and temporal filter by convolutional neural networks. And this is a hybrid model that we designed inspired by Renz LES coupling. The idea is that given a velocity field W, we can pass it into the spatial filter 
to obtain our spatial component. And then we pass the residual into the temporal filter that give us the temporal component. The rest of the velocity field, we call it residual, can be further modeled with a third component. So for each of the components, we basically use a unit, which is on the right-hand side, to, to encode the velocity field into hidden representations and decode jointly into our future forecast. So we've done a lot of study in the paper, but here I want to show you the key results behind this model. Right? The, the motivation that we set out this project is to speed up turbulence simulation. So we look at the average runtime per frame for different models. So lattice Boltzmann um, method is the classic numerical method that was used to simulate the turbulence. And TFNet is our model. We also compared with a lot of video prediction models, such as GANs, ResNet, convolutional LSTMs, um, in, as well as physics-based models, including SST and deep hidden physics model. So these models explicitly take into account uh, the physical equations governing the turbulence. So you can see that our model cut the runtime by half from the LBM method, which is numerical method used to simulate this turbulence. And again, I want to uh, make a note here that the turbulence that we used for this experiment is a 2D turbulence in a relatively small resolution. So we expect the speed up to be more pronounced for a 3D turbulence and the much higher resolution turbulence. So the right plot here is perhaps the most important plot for CFD community. The idea here is we'll look at energy spectrum of the predicted turbulence versus different wave number. So the way you can understand this picture is that, you know, energy corresponding to different frequencies in the turbulence. And if we look at the different frequency decomposition of turbulence, we have an idea of how realistic this turbulence is in terms of physical realist realism, right? So the solid line is the ground truth, which really calculated from the input data, the ground truth data. And then the two dash line, you know, in blue and the gray color. So these are also known as the Kolmogorov scale. And these are theoretical energy spectra for turbulence. So two variations of our model, TFNet and constraint TF net, which is a blue line, uh, dash dot line, right? and then the orange line here, they're closest to the uh, ground truth, which is a black solid line here. Um, and the rest of the model, such as ResNet, right, even though it's a state-of-art method for computer vision, it is very far away from the ground truth, which signifies the importance of incorporating physical knowledge in this type of applications. You can see that you know, the ResNet, even though it predicted well for natural videos, it doesn't do well for this type of video prediction tests. Let me show you the realization of the predicted turbulence. So we showed the target, which is the ground truth, and the predictions from our model. We also compared it with ResNet and GANs to look at the importance of physics, uh, physics uh, principles. So here is a realization, right? As you can see here, uh, this is the 2D Rene Bernard convection. And the most important feature you should look for is the two circular patterns on this turbulence. So you can see that, let me play this again, right? So you can see that our model, the TFNet, can actually capture this kind of circular patterns in the turbulence, whereas the baseline only learns a very uh, blurry uh, averaging example of the turbulence. And in the, that's also, another example of why we want to bring in physics and deep learning together, right? And the idea here is to parameterize the operators, essentially the convolutional operators. Let's see. There's a question uh, from uh, M. Ray, sorry if I pronounce your name incorrectly. Um, when defining operation that captures physics, I see how this will work when applied to inputs because inputs are non-physical quantities. This is not the case for hidden layers. Can such operators be applied to hidden layers? Oh, that's a great question. Actually, I'm just going to talk about that in a few slides later. Um, so for, for the techniques I've talked to so far, right? So uh, diffusion operator and uh, uh, convolutional operator, it is true that they are applied to inputs. Um, for hidden layers, you need something more intricate. And I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. 
Okay, so that's the second uh, framework, right? So then the, the last of type of techniques that I want to share with you is really can work in both input and hidden layers. Uh, and this is something called weight symmetry. Um, so weight symmetry, actually it was inspired by uh, the famous uh, physicist uh, uh, Noder, right? So Noder had this theorem says that for every symmetry, there is a corresponding conservation law, right? So in order to make something physically meaningful, we need to make sure that the predictions satisfy these conservation laws, such as energy conservation, mass conservation, et cetera. And the nice thing between uh, Noether theorem is that it makes the direct connection between conservation laws and symmetry. So we can explicitly design symmetry into our machine learning models. So the setup here is that given, again, given historical data, x0 to xt, we want to forecast into the future using a function f. So we need to uh, borrow some concepts from group theory, right? The idea is that if we have a group, which is a set G with a composition map, we can make a function equivalent, which means it has built-in symmetry by enforcing this function to be uh, equivalent within this group action. So the idea here is that if we have a group G and then we want to learn a function F, in order to make the function F symmetric or equivalent in our case, what we can do is we can explicitly design certain weight sharing schemes such that this functional approximator, which is a deep neural network have built in symmetry, such as translation symmetry, rotation symmetry, and et cetera. And this actually applies not only to the input layers, but also to the hidden layers. So let me give you a few examples of behind this idea of weight symmetry, right? Again, we apply this technique to turbulence forecasting and we extend this turbulence uh, problem not only from simulations, but also to real world turbulence from atmospheric science turbulence, the ocean turbulence and air dynamics. And this work was done by uh, my student and postdoc. Uh, and this was on archive recently. So there's a large literature actually in this line of work called equivariant deep learning. And one of the key results here is by Weiler and the CESA in 2019. So this theorem states that a convolutional layer is equivalent if, only, if and only if the kernel satisfies this kind of condition, which is its equation, right? So if we can find the action map row inverse and row in and row out in a smart way by way sharing, then we can guarantee the convolutional layer to be G equivalent. And that's the key idea. So we extended this idea to dynamical setting for forecasting turbulence. Essentially, if we, if we use you know, multi-layer 3D CNNs, we can make, you know, we can naturally have time translation equivalent because CNNs are in, intrinsically time translation equivalent. And one key requirement there is that we need the predictions to be generated in an autoregressive fashion, meaning that we need to generate prediction at time t based on a prediction from t, t plus one and do this in a recursive fashion. So we made several contributions to equivariant deep learning by designing rotational equivariant kernels in this form, scale equivariant kernels in this form, and uh, there are actually some intricacy in designing scale equivariant kernels for physical dynamics, because we actually need to take care of the scale in both you know, the physical scale, which is on the right-hand side equation, as well as you know, the resolution, which is number of pixels per velocity field, which is take care of here. So I won't get into details of how we came up with this equation, but essentially you see that using different parameterization, we have obtained you know, specific action maps in the convolutional kernel, and that can guarantee our convolutional layer to be G equivalent. So the reason we want our model to be equivalent is because we want our model to generalize to different domains, right? Think about you know, uh, a simple example of translation. So if our ground truth is in 
a shifted domain, uh, if our training data is in particular domain. But then when we shifted the data to a slightly different domain, the non-equivalent models won't work because they don't, they don't generalize to a shifted domain or translation domain, translated domain. However, if we have a model that are built in to be translation equivalent, it means that the predictions are very, uh, they are basically robust against this kind of changes in data distribution. So here is the realization result. Uh, you can see that if we look at the target, which is the ground truth, and the non-equivariant model completely fails because it doesn't know to generalize, and our equivariant models does well for this kind of translation operations. And uh, we basically show this results for different type of symmetries. So rotation symmetry is the same way, right? Um, I'm not sure why the video is not showing. And then we also apply this to uniform motion symmetry and scale symmetry as well. So this plot is uh, the plot that I'm most excited about. And this is the generalization plot actually for our model. So we compared with ResNet, right, which is a non-equivariant model. And the scale equivariant ResNet is, our re is ResNet with scale equivariance. So this shows the forecasting error in RMSE versus different scaling factors on test sets. So idea here, if we change the test set to different scales, you can see that the error of ResNet completely explodes very quickly. However, because of building equivariance in our model, our equivariant ResNet is much more robust against the distributional shift for scaling. So this phenomenon also appears for energy spectrum error. So this is a metric that we use to quantify the physical characteristics of our predictions. Again, we can see that with different scaling in the test set, our model is rather robust against this kind of changes in data, distri data distribution. Um, and we also looked at a very different application. So, so far I've showed you of equivariant models in uh, what they call the uh, Eulerian simulation, right? Means that we have a, a lattice or grid and we're measuring the velocity field on the grid. So another application in a kind of fluid language is called the Lagrangian, uh, for, like a Lagrangian simulation, right? So the idea is that we follow, you know, not, we are not looking at a fixed point to measure the velocity, but instead we follow each of the particles. And in this case, we apply this idea to trajectory forecasting problem. So this is a paper recently out on archive. Um, so the problem here we want to look at is tra trajectory prediction, right? So, you know, if we look at the trajectory of the vehicles, we really can make the analogy that they are like little particles traveling around in space. So then we can borrow ideas from fluid dynamics to make predictions for uh, autonomous vehicles. Again, this kind of wave symmetry appears in this kind of uh, real world application, because if we look at the picture here, right, we have three cars in this red bubble here. You can see that this car drives in a very regular fashion, meaning that there's a, this green car tries to cross to, towards the red car, right? So it tried to move to its left, right, on this picture. And then this is another example, which basically we rotate the road by 90 degrees. And you can see it, even though we rotate the road by 90 degrees, right, meaning that maybe it happens on the other side of the earth, or in different direction, this phenomenon also happens again, where the green car tries to cross, you know, to, to again, now to this left, right? So you can see that this simple, very simple intricate motion pattern, you know, is unchanged in regardless of our coordinate, reference coordinates, right? If we rotate the road by 90 degree, the motion states, there's this kind of motion pattern states, and that's the key idea behind this paper, which we want to build symmetry into trajectory prediction models such that it can take care of this kind of domain shift. And this work, work again was led by a postdoc, Robin. Um, and the key mathematical tools that we used is something called equivariant continuous convolution, right? As I mentioned before, in order to make a convolutional layer equivariant, we need to design very specific group actions to make them uh, equivalent. And the idea behind equivalent continuous convolution is we use something called a torus kernel field. 
So a torus kernel itself, it, it kernel itself is a field. So, so at every point here, it generates a matrix. So this matrix is trainable weights in a neural network. And for different, because we're looking at the continuous uh, space, right, for trajectories, we need to look at, you know, basically relative position from every car to the neighbors in the circle. So for every, you know, if we think about as a pizza, right, for every different rings of this pizza, we use a different uh, matrix to parameterize it. Um, we need to make sure that it follows a circular shift rule as explained here, right? So circular, we rotate this to make sure the matrix satisfy the circular shifting. And then we want to make share weights across the pizza slice, right? That's a symmetry idea. And then there's a center here, which is a bullseye. So the bullseye is also trainable, but it needs to be constrained a different way to be circular to preserving the circular shifting rule because there's singularities here. And the right-hand side, it shows that this torus kernel, right, which is a tiny matrix here on the left here, operates on features on the circle, right? So because we're looking at continuous convolution, so by cutting open the torus, and the features along the red and orange line here, right, around, around the red and orange line here, we can identify the operation at each point of the feature with a matrix multiplication, right? So this is the key idea behind this work. And we can, of course, plug in this con equivariant continuous convolution into a trajectory forecasting idea where we encode the trajectories using a simple neural nets like convolutional neural nets Right then we obtain different kinds of representations for you know, very local, uh, for a map, right? We have map information, we have multi-agent interactions right, from different cars. Then we have the single agent behavior, which represent how this car will drive according to him or herself. Then we apply you know, our equivariant convolution to make sure this hidden layer stays equivariant. Um, and then we apply this kind of continuous convolution on torus kernel several times, which leads to multi-layer continuous convolutional kernel. And after that, we generate the predicted value here. We are predicting the delta uh, velocity, the velocity difference, uh, the velocity actually, which is the difference in position. So the diff real difference here is we extended the previous work from continuous convolution to equivariant con continuous convolution, which built in symmetry by weight sharing. Um, we can look at the performance comparison here on two real world data sets, right? So the Argoverse is one of the benchmark data sets for self-driving vehicle trajectory prediction. Um, it was a large data set released by Argoverse, which is a self-driving car company in Pittsburgh. Um, TrajetNet is another recently released uh, large scale trajectory data set. Um, it has uh, basically trajectories of pedestrians. So we look at different uh, baselines here, constant velocity, which look at, you know, treat the velocity as unchanged over time. And nearest neighbor is non-parametric method. OSTM is a simple baseline, continue used in Argoverse. Continuous convolution is our competitor here without equivariance. So ACO, which is our model, right, stands for equivariant and continuous convolution. We look at two different kinds of representations, so row one representation and regular representation. So regular representation really takes care of the hidden layers. We can see that for you know, average distance error, right, for, for one second to three seconds, our method is the most accurate method for among all these space signs. And compared with VectorNet, which is a recent model released by Waymo, uh, it can only uh, predict actually a single vehicle once, uh, once per time. And our model can predict multiple vehicles simultaneously, so we also you know, put the numbers here just for your reference. You can see that our numbers are very close with vector net. And most importantly, our models is quite parameter efficient. And we basically cut completely compare with the continuous convolutional model, which uses about 1000 K parameters. Ours is only one third, one tenth of that. And this parameter efficiency shows the advantage of built in physical intuition and inductive biases to reduce the number of weights in our models, right? So here is the, prim, the, the figure for sample efficiency. So this is the validation curve for you know, distance error at three seconds over different training examples. You see that our model, which is a 
the yellow the yellow line here, right? It converges really fast on to with only three thousand examples, whereas the non-equivariant model is a the blue line here needs a lo long time, need a, a lot of examples to converge to a decent accuracy. Uh, you see that because we incorporate this kind of physical intuition through weight symmetry, we can significantly cut the number of examples we need to train the models. So, so, so far I've talked about, you know, three type of work that we've explored so far to combine physics intuition and uh, data-driven models. And on top of that, we've done some other work for interpretable tensor learning, generative models for sequences, um, relational inference, right, to understand the relations in basketball play, um, and deep imitation learning, trying to imitate the dynamics in robots for bimanual manipulation. And all in all, I'm very excited about this area of spatial temporal learning, especially learning spatial temporal dynamics. And uh, we've explored a lot of techniques and we're always welcome new ideas and new thoughts for further along our research. Finally, I want to share a quote here, um, which is by one of my idols, Albert Einstein, but he said, time and space are not conditional existence. Time and space is a model of thinking. Hopefully after my talk today, I can get you to think a little bit more in the mode of space and time. And I want to make a note that all the code and the data are all available on my website. You can also follow me on Twitter to get written updates of our research. And I want to thank all the sponsors for this research. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Rose. Mm -hmm. Great presentation. Um, I think we have time for questions. Um, maybe type your questions into the chat and uh, then I guess I can read them. Um, Maybe to kind of get started with one question that I have. Um, so um, can you tell us a little bit more about the training, like the loss function that you essentially used when you were training your, your drone? Um, you know, uh, what was kind of the learning paradigm that you used there when you were sort of learning the, the, the you know, velocity perturbations that were sort of hard to predict by the physical model? So how did you, yes. how did you train this? Yeah. So, so actually, so we split into two parts. So we first learned dynamics model actually by simply minimizing the mean square error between the observed uh, velocity and then the uh, I mean observed the velocity and predicted the velocity. Right? Mm -hmm. And we can observe the velocity by attaching a sensor on the drone. Um, and after we learn the dynamics model, right? So the key idea there is to learn a better dynamics model by explicitly modeling the air dynamics. Um, after we learn the dynamics model, we can plug this better learned air dynamics uh, into a control loop. So then after that, the second step is to use a PID controller. And we need some uh, adjustment for the coefficients of the rotor, et cetera. And these are actually classic working control. So we split the work into two steps. And I, yeah, I didn't go into details for this work. Yeah, thank you. Very, very, imp very impressive. Um, all right, so let's see. I don't know if I should kind of just take the last question maybe, or there were earlier there's ones. Some, there's some questions on the chat. Right. Maybe we can, we can yeah. let me see. Um, so, so Alexander said a couple of minutes ago, many of the problems you described, such as climate data, data and turbulence, specifically break time symmetry due to the error of time. Could you somehow integrate the symmetry of this asymmetry into the network architecture? Oh, I see. How can I incorporate mm -hmm. the symmetry of this asymmetry into the neural network? Hmm, I, that's a clever idea. I haven't thought about it, actually. Maybe that's the next paper. And if you're interested, we can discuss more detail offline. Um, all right, and maybe a more recent one. Um, uh, Will asked, uh, I had a question regarding when you discussed the work with the drone. Uh, do you mind repeating what you were saying about the difficulties with considering the Navier-Stokes equations? Oh, yes. So because you know, simulating Navier-Stokes equation requ uh, requires us to solve for two things. One is pressure, right? The other one is the velocity. So for solving the pressure, we need to solve a Poisson equation, uh, which by itself is hard. It doesn't have a closed form solution, actually. So then you have to use numerical techniques such as finite difference or finite element method, which is pretty expensive from a computational perspective. And we cannot afford to, to solve accurately, right? That's, that's just the only in simulation. So the real uh, scenario is that we don't even know whether the air dynamics is 
uh, actually navi stokes right because we have air we have ground and then the dynamics become really complicated all right hope that Perfect. answers your question thanks a lot um Okay, I think this is probably good. We're a few minutes after the scheduled end. Uh, thank you so much, Rose. This was a really fascinating talk and I really look Thank forward you. to catching up with you talking more about details.